Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hi, Sarah. How are you today? Hi, Michael. I'm good, thanks. How are you? How was your day? Yeah, I'm really well. My day was amazing. Um, busy, but good. Yeah. And the, the weather warmed up a bit. Um, just for our listeners, we're in the United Kingdom and we're having another great start to our summer, which is very variable. It can be October one day and then it can be boiling hot the next. We never know what to wear. <laughs> that is so true. I think I'm, last night I was wearing my winter sweatshirt and this morning it was like, where are my sandals? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Get the flip flops out quick. That's the one. I mean, I, I took the dog for a walk this afternoon and I had like a fleecy sweatshirt on because it looked really gray out. And when I got out, the clouds parted, the sun came out. It was like burning on my head. Yeah. I went, Where's my cap? I left that behind. Yeah. <laughs> took the sweatshirt off and it was mad. Yeah, it is mad in this country. It is. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Um, I am interested in hearing your story, as I am with most people. Uh, well, every person that comes on the podcast, <laughs> to be honest. And um, I know there are some interesting things that have happened in your life to date. And I'm going to start with a really open question, and then I'm going to hand it over to you, and I will listen. Okay. So, Sarah, please share with us your story and how did you get to where you are today well there there is the question isn't it as open yes. as it can be um I mean I started I think my story really started sort of school age hmm. I was always trying to achieve and you know it's not until you're shall we say later in life that you realize that some of the things you thought you understood about those times that my parents always pushed me to achieve and all this. It's not until you sort of, you know, I'm mid forties um, that you go, hang on a minute. They weren't actually that pushy. <laughs> no. A lot of it was what I put on myself. Yeah. And so you then start to look at, you know, the path that my life has taken in a slightly different way. And that, you know, a lot of the pressures that I put on myself, mm were just that they came from me they were my interpretation of what was expected of me or what was needed and actually because I didn't want to disappoint people and I didn't want to you know be seen to fail or not to be able to achieve then I, I didn't really ask for help and I didn't ask for clarity yeah it's really you know I I took a job I was I was looking after 50 countries across the globe from pharmaceutical company. All right. Very small countries, you know, very little infrastructure, not much. They're called the emerging markets because they are just beginning to come out of, you know, what we would have, you know, what we would have been like in maybe the 50s, 60s. Yes. They're just, they're just picking up. They're just developing their, their whole country, the way they work. And so I was looking after these people who, you know, we were in Switzerland, where I was based at the time, looking at new and innovative ways to give aspirin or to give. Mm. And actually, the countries that I had to look after still hadn't had tablets. You know, no. the tablet was still new to them. And here we were with, you know, skin patches and injections and nasal sprays. And they were like, oh, here's just a little tablet that you take with some water. Um, and so you had that complete dichotomy of living in an environment that was very fast moving, always innovative, where are we going next? And yet on yes. a new basis, seeing, you know, the real basic of what do people need at that very base level? Um, yeah. I loved about my job. You know, I was, I was one of those people whose Instagram looked like I, you know, was always in these amazing places because I would take pictures in you know, airports and planes and lounges and, various hotels but yes I traveled 85 percent of the time wow I only saw hotels offices and airports you know yeah I said I was in Guatemala I wasn't there to see anything 
that the country had to offer I was there to go to the office and go, yeah. and go back to the hotel and sleep and that was the same in all the countries and but I so wanted to help people and I loved working with them that I just kept pushing myself and pushing myself to the point where my body was like we don't know what time zone we're in we don't know what we're eating are we eating breakfast or is it dinner have we yeah okay and so all the sort of basic things went out the window you know I wasn't exercising I wasn't meeting with friends I didn't mm. eat I didn't drink properly you know all those little things that my body was screaming at me we need to change yeah and that's where for me the burnout really made itself felt in that I had these migraines that would last for days wow by the time I hit the sort of the worst of it 25 days a month I had a migraine whoa so you know the headache which feels like there's an ice pick embedded in your skull or mm. the pain to stop the you know cold room dark room where all you have is you and your inner chatter which you know at the best of times is you know I certainly found mine was not particularly helpful um and when you're no. in that amount of pain it um yeah it almost goes into overdrive yeah, of course. And what, just to, I mean, do you think it was it because of the travel, the time zones, the food, the stress? The, I mean, eighty-five percent being traveling is that must take a toll. You know, being in different time zones. Do you think it was that, or what do you think? Did you find out what caused it? So. I was stressed most of the time. And I think the important thing to say was that most of the time I was not bad stressed. I Mm. enjoyed working in those countries. I enjoyed experiencing the different cultures. I was just putting my body through incredible stresses in order to keep up that pace. Yes. I didn't sleep properly. because My body never knew what time of day it was. Um, My eating habits. So my nourishment was virtually nil I would grab whatever it was and it was usually sandwiches of some sort Um, yeah and the migraine was my body saying we need to stop we need to change something and there was always that well when I take a holiday I'll have a long weekend I'll on next vacation I'll read all those books I'll do something for me I've just got to finish this project and then I'll there was always And then Ireland and looking after myself was always something that got pushed to the back of the queue. Yes. And it, you know, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't just that I had migraines, you know, I had dental surgery that wouldn't actually take my body just couldn't heal. So my implant right. in my jaw took three or four attempts for us to actually get them where the bone integrates with the, the uh, implant because my, right. my body just did not have enough of what it needed to actually heal yeah and that's that's what you know our bodies are amazing in the sense Mm. of they can be stressed in that fight flight response in which case they shut down everything that we don't need apart from what we need to keep ourselves safe yes or they can heal digest rest when they know it's safe Mm. all the happy hormones that you hear about Uh, dopamine oxytocin serotonin the endorphins those only happen when you're not stressed out right you can't be both (laughs) (laughs) and oh i can be stressed and happy it's like actually hormonally you can't because the building blocks for stress for cortisol are exactly the same things as going to making endorphins and serotonin and the body can't make both at the same time. No. It's like you're making and, a cake mix and going, oh, this one's going to be red and this one's going to be blue. Well, you can't make red and blue in the same bowl. And no. It's the same. <laughs> so they have to be separate. And the body doesn't like two. It just makes one of them. And for me, you know, it was pretty much only making stress hormones. And with the stress hormones, if I'm not mistaken, because they, because the body believes it's in fight and flight, mode it will prioritize that because that is the survival mode it's 
for when you're chasing the tiger in the jungle or running away from a tiger in the jungle, yeah. rather, <laughs> ch chasing the piglet for dinner, um, which is the fight and flight. But yeah, it's more the tiger chasing you. Then those get prioritized. It goes, well, the healing bit and the happy hormones can wait. <laughs> yeah. This is more important because I'm trying to make sure you stay alive. Exactly. Yeah. The body tends to ask two questions. Am I safe? Yes or no. And can I get safe? Yes. So you answer that question. I am safe. So it goes, oh, well, then we can digest that big bit of dinner that we ate three hours ago now. Yes. We can sleep properly because I'm not stressed about that tiger that wants to, you know, eat me for its dinner. Yeah. And the problem is your body only has so many resources. And so you go into adrenal fatigue and the body keeps mm -hmm. producing cortisol but it's at the expense of other systems in the body. Right. Now, what I needed to help with my migraines was serotonin. Right. The happy hormones. And whilst I'm stressed, my body isn't producing serotonin. Right. How to produce serotonin would be to actually go and out, take a walk, actually get some exercise. But I was mm. a migraine where my body was going, I need it dark cold and I can't move I'm just gonna lie yeah. until it passes and so you have all these vicious cycles of I need to walk to create the hormone that will stop my head hurting but I can't go outside because my head is hurting so much that I don't want yes to think. Um, and that was really this complete imbalance of things mm. was how it got so bad to the point where you're like I just don't want to be in pain anymore right not you know you know, I literally on my 37th birthday was in so much pain that I said, I don't, I don't, there's not going to be a 38th. It's right. I'm done. Um, and I set about a plan, which would be for another six months. And at the end of it, I would, I would end my life. Wow. I had literally got to that point where it's like, you know, that internal chatter that I mentioned was, I was going to disappoint people. I had taken redundancy, so I had failed. Mm. Job, I wasn't even good enough to go to work. I couldn't even get out of bed. You know, all these things. You just like the whole time, you're literally in your own head going, you're a fake. Yeah. Yeah. You've got nothing to give. Nobody needs anything. So I decided that actually, you know, what I needed was to be pain free. And the way to do that was, yeah, to not be here, to leave the planet. And did you discuss that with anybody at the time or did you keep all of that to yourself? So it was all a secret. Um, right. But I never told anybody from the from the outside. You know, I. Well, yeah, I put everything in place that people would think everything was OK. Um, yeah. I went to I went to Los Angeles to learn how to be a better public speaker. Um, I set up. I, you know, I started to build a website for a business that I knew was never going to launch. But right. Long, you know, as long as I was putting on Facebook, oh, I'm writing website copy today. Nobody was going to question about what you're actually thinking about. You know, they think they're just you're just moving on um, with a new venture or you're trying something different. And so, yeah, the outside world life was, you know, changing. I was no longer in corporate. Um, but yeah, things were still looking quite positive however the, the reality of that was was very different yeah wow i'm so sorry you came at that point sarah um what what then happened what changed so i i had always wanted to volunteer and there was an orphanage in vietnam that i had made a short visit to in the summer sort of around about the point where I was like you know what I'm, I'm done and in this orphanage you know it's for disabled children and the elderly and war veterans uh, who are taken care of by the state but you know there was a room of children there probably 20 children who all they wanted was somebody to play catch with them draw with them color in play lego uh, throw a ball uh, yeah all over I was pretty good at that too uh, you know, just things to make them laugh and, you know, to give them a hug, you know, that that contact that they weren't getting, you know, because of the numbers of them versus staff and things. And that, 
it was a place where I actually felt I could actually offer something to somebody. I think yeah. Well, again, you know, I could still hug people. I had so much love that I wanted to give. And it's like, you know, these kids, yeah, that's the place that I'm going to spend the last three months of my life. With these kids. Right. And for some reason, you know, so I, I flew out there at the beginning of November. My date was the end of January and decided that if it was going to be my final Christmas, then I was going to be Santa Claus for these children. Right. In a country that doesn't celebrate Christmas, um, but Coca-Cola still put Father Christmas on the Coke cans. So they yeah. vaguely knew who this person was. And I'll be honest, if I went to the market, I couldn't even buy shorts and a T-shirt. You know, I'm, no. I'm taller than the Vietnamese and, you know, slightly bigger. Um, and so when you go to the market and you find a complete Santa costume that fits you as if it was made for you, it's a piece of you that goes, OK, I'm doing this. Yeah. And that you know, that day, I spent the whole day happy. You know, I spent a whole morning handing out lollipops and hugs and having my beard pulled and everything um, by children who couldn't believe that somebody was dressed up and, you know, making funny noises. Um, and then the afternoon, I spent it with some war veterans. You know, we were handing out bananas because it was, I think it was a Thursday, so it was fruit day. And, you know, we I couldn't speak Vietnamese, but you could, over bananas and a biscuit, understand that for these people, when you walk in as Father Christmas, there was, there was memories there. Yeah. You saw people smile, you saw people say things, and the staff would tell me that these people hadn't spoken for years, but they mm. would be on Sam Noel, which is Father Christmas in Vietnamese. And you're like, you just wondered where they had seen this character. Yeah. And that was a, that was a very different day for me. You know, from morning to night, I laughed, I smiled, I, yeah, I was just happy. And that was a feeling that I hadn't had in quite a long time. And at the end of the day, they told us that one of the little girls was not going to make it through the night and we should say our goodbyes. So I went into a room in this orphanage where I had never been before. I'd never been into that room and I didn't know the little girl. And I'm still dressed as Father Christmas, so I still have this very long white beard. And I lean over the crib and she puts her hand in my beard. And we breathe. And we take a deep breath. And it's in that moment, it, it literally is that light bulb moment that says she is fighting for every breath. And she has a couple of hours left. Mm. And yet to her, breathing is the most important thing. And I, in four or five weeks time just want to stop what you know and in that moment she gave me a reason to breathe was that there had to be a reason why I'd taken the journey that I had yeah could I help other people mm. so we probably breathed for a minute two minutes together and I left that room and it was the only way to describe it is a bit like what happens when you delete a file on the computer yeah screen pops up and says are you sure and for me it was well I have a plan but now I have a reason to breathe this gift that she's given me am I sure I still want to go down the route I planned or is this something different and it was that piece around learning to ask for help because that's one thing I had really always struggled with yeah asking for help admitting that things weren't going so well you know I'd always found that difficult and I got back to our guest house that night and I only had one book in my room and I only had one business card and it was from a coach I'd met on that trip to LA and he had written in the front of my book the bigger the dream the better the life yeah now I'll be quite honest Michael I hated this man from the moment <laughs> I met him all the way through his classes, I was like, I never, ever want to be in a room with him again. Yeah. I felt that he could read my mind. I felt he knew what I was planning. And so I just wanted to keep as much distance between us as possible. Yeah. And yet when I got home that Christmas day, I was like, what do I do now? I need to ask somebody because I'd created this thing in my head. I'd created my thoughts, my beliefs about how bad things were, how dark things were. Yeah. And Einstein says that 
the level of thinking that creates a problem can't create the solution. Mm. And that's where I was. It's like, if I don't know how to think any differently. I don't know how to make another plan. So I need to ask for help. Yeah. So I reached out to this man who I didn't like very much. And it was almost that second chance of, if he says he'll help me, there's a different path for me. If he says no, he won't, then I still have my plan. Yeah. And he came back and said, yeah, let's work, you know, let's work together. Now, I didn't tell him what had happened that day that made me reach out and call him. All I asked him to do was to help me be a better speaker, which was how I'd met him on a speaker. Call. Right. Yeah. All he knew was that I wanted to be better on the stage, more authentic. And it was not until after six months of working with him that they actually told the truth about where the story had actually gone. Right. And it's felt that, you know, the question you asked right at the beginning, how did you get here today? He asked a similar question in a class. And it was like, what did you learn this week? A very mm. open ended question. And I always believed that the story I've just told would remain in the vaults forever. Nobody would ever hear it. I would never tell anybody what I'd been thinking. And yet on that day, that question was enough to unlock me telling the story. And that was the very first time that I had, I had told anybody what I'd been planning. Yeah. And it was a moment in that of, I told my story and then two other people got up and admitted to one had an eating disorder, one had um, suffered abuse. And both of them then went on to get the help that they needed. And both of them yeah. said, if you hadn't sold your story, I wouldn't have got up. And that became the reason to breathe. Yeah. It's not about everybody having to be a burnout, burning out or suffering, you know, the, exactly the same story as I did. It's about knowing that people are struggling yes and people and everybody you look at could be struggling in some way some of people are just very good at hiding it i was incredibly good at hiding things yes and yet that biggest fear that i had would have been of disappointing people or telling people that i was struggling and yet when i finally told my family my friends what had been going on the first thing they all said was I would have been at your door. I would have been on the phone in a couple of minutes if you had needed me. I oh, know. The help is there, but it is our own fears that stop us from asking. 100%. And so that is, yeah, the journey for me is to help people to yeah, find a reason to breathe that's powerful enough for them to be able to ask for help and move away from whatever the darkness is in their life. And it's the hardest thing. I mean, it's such a important thing to do for yourself. It has so much value for you if you're able to do it. Mm -hmm. And I know people very close to me that I can see them not being able to ask for the right kind of help. They're asking for some kind of help, and this is what happens, but they are fearful of asking really the most important question to the right people for the kind of help that they need. And there's nothing you can do. You know, I mean, the thing is, what you did, even though you might have put the white flag up and go, help me, you know, I, I surrender type of thing to your closest family. But they may not have been the right people to have helped you in that moment in time. What you actually did was... And this is where I think is the fundamental difference in terms of asking for help or actually doing it yourself. <laughs> you know, the fact is you approached that coach, 
and you asked for help from him and that was the bit that unlocked it and then okay eventually you it gave you permission to share but you were already on that journey you had taken the step and i think that is the important thing i mean you can be sitting you know you can be helping people and go i'm sarah i help people with burnout come and talk to me you know you could have a whole room full of people and they know deep inside they are suffering with burnout but none of them will step forward because the time might not be right for them to take that exactly. first step and it's it's yeah i mean i i say to people although i have people sharing many stories you know i've done about 140 plus interviews now on this podcast and there is always suffering involved <laughs> you know we are exactly the same times places events um situations are all different but apart from that we are all living the same story we all go through suffering at some point in our lives whether we're younger middle aged older it doesn't matter we all yeah. will experience it through the decades at some point you know and um so i'm really grateful that you're sharing this story that you have shared the story and but i just wanted to pick on that slight you know distinction in terms of asking for help and actually doing it yourself um rather than going i'm in trouble i'm a victim you've got to sort me out type of thing you know um which and that to be honest i think so i had been in corporate roles corporate jobs for all of my working life at that point yeah 15 15 years 16 years at that point yeah and I'd never asked for help I'd always you know covered it up thick skinned I'll just put up with it I'll push through push through push through and it's no real surprise that the coach that I picked and the the journey that I went on to heal had nothing to do with corporate. No. I took acting classes. I took singing lessons. Yeah. I took dancing classes. I puked on stage because I was so unfit. And there's only so many crunches you can do before your body goes, that was too much breakfast. Um, but the biggest difference was I was surrounded by people who thought differently. Hmm. I was, I was not surrounded by people whose plan was, you know, to create a billion dollar, you know, a billion dollar drug that was, you know, going to cure everything. I was around people who were dreaming of winning an Oscar, of creating the stories, of taking the best pictures and everything. People who dreamed and people who would make do anything to make that dream come true. They would work three horrible jobs to get an audition in front of one casting director. They would, they would go to auditions, you know, hundreds of auditions and be told no before they got a yes. But there was always this piece about dreaming. Mm. It, it's true. I, in the whole of my corporate career at that point, I'd never had a dream. I'd never dreamt of being, you know, head of a company or it was no. just what is that next job? What is my yeah. next promotion? What is the next role? And yeah, I would never have, you know, I had goals and had objectives and I would, mm. I would have plans, but I never really had that dream that lit me up. No. That was what changed for me in that, you know, I'd, you'd heard all this stuff about Simon Sinek's book, Start With Why. I, was like, I had no idea about why. I was pretty much convinced that you had to start with what, when, and how before you got yes. anything to do with why you're doing it yeah until i had that experience it was to say actually when you find your reason to breathe all the other things fall into place yeah the dreams come you it's easier to make decisions 
around things because you're you're focused on something that you're that you're aiming for and it's not mm. you know, the name on the door or the number of zeros on your paycheck there was that it was a very different feeling for me but like like you were saying I had to be in the right place at the right time to ask for that help yeah I had to do four or five classes in order to be free enough to then tell my story and I then did several more before I was comfortable telling it without sobbing my way through it yes and only after a couple of years, you know, the first book that I, you know, get provided a chapter for, only then did it become finding your reason to breathe. And well, what does it look like? How do I help people with burnout? How do I help them prevent it? How do I help them recover? Mm. This is then up to fall into place. There, you know, it's not a case of you Friday, oh, well, I'm going to cure myself of burnout this weekend and you come in on Monday. I'm good. Let's go. New project. It, it's not it was you know <laughs> and there are people who believe that is how yes you it. and you know we we could probably spend hours talking about that yeah do, do you have a checklist for that um I, I have a checklist called are you burning out um just yes. yes. just 15 questions um yes no questions because sometimes we are getting signals from our body from our environment that we don't mm. really notice as you know this I need to think about this and so I slept about one or two hours a night I drank an awful lot of soda well wow. um, um I didn't really eat properly I, I isolated myself from a lot of people um because it was just easier to say no to everything and explain why I wasn't you know as happy or as awake as maybe I'd been previously yeah when I finally sort of put all these things together and you go, okay, 15 questions. Well, I would have ticked 14 of them at the height of my burnout. And I probably would have ticked 15 if I'd known what number 15 was um, at the time. Yeah. And sometimes it's just like, some people just aren't ready to say, I'm burning out. I need help. And sometimes it starts with, well, what might those red flags be? You know, so if you're not sleeping properly, you wake up exhausted and you stop going to the gym, but that used to be your way to de-stress, then something has changed in the balance of your life and it's probably worth giving it some time. But you might not have put all three, three of those things together. Mm. And so in a lot of cases, for me, working with clients, it's about getting to sleep better, to eat proper, to hydrate and be happy more times than they're not happy before you start to look at how do you prevent burnout happening again? Yeah. And, you know, we don't have this in the UK, but in the US, if you have any sort of surgery that involves uh, local anaesthetic or sedation, they yeah. have to tell you not to sign anything, not to sign any contractual documents for 48 hours because you're not with it. And it's the same thing with any sort of stress, anxiety, depression until you are back in a more normal state don't make decisions about your life going forward no so I couldn't you know I couldn't in that moment envisage a good life but I knew I wanted to change but the decisions I would have made or the decisions I made when I was in the height of the burnout where I wanted to end my life yeah but a year later it was like right I'm going to write a book I'm going to start a business and I want to help other people through this. Yeah. And I want, you know, I want to speak, speak internationally. And, you know, suddenly I had all these dreams that came from being in a different place. When I asked the question, what do you want? Yeah. Yeah. In the summer, it was, I want to be pain free and out of here. And by the, a year later was, I want to help other people. I want, you know, I want to eradicate burnout. If I, you know, the big, the big hairy audacious goal would be we'll get rid of it. Let's get rid of it. Yeah. Those all come from very little steps that build up into something bigger. Yeah. And somebody may need to hear me speak a couple of times or read a couple of things or, you know, maybe they're fine. And then there's one event at work. And it's suddenly like, it's like the floodgates open. 
yeah everything everything then comes together and you're like i'm not in a good place but the right people will hear it when they when they need to and when they're ready and yeah when they're ready, i mean absolutely i was it's very weird how it happens because i mean just just a tiny example and i just want to pick up on your healing journey when you were doing all the creative stuff in a bit before i forget and i was listening to a particular podcast one afternoon morning whatever i was doing some stuff in the kitchen had the podcast on and actually it's it's called 10 percent happier podcast i highly recommend okay. it yeah. yeah um it's an american guy and Dan Harris and anyway he burned out <laughs> he had burnout and he literally melted he's a news anchor and he melted on t live tv he, he couldn't speak anymore and he's gone and done this podcast about meditation wrote a book about meditation and he has all these guests on but this one particular guest I thought was shouting and really quite assertive <laughs> and i really noticed it you know you kind of got it in the background and went oh this lady is really making a point really strongly you know it's about the conditioned mind and i'm like really intently listening to all of this and as a result this rarely happens as a result i went to find her on the internet i found her other podcasts and i was fascinated about this particular Buddhist teaching about the conditioned mind. And I, I just loved it. And, you know, researched it, blogged about it, listened to it, listened to it again and again and again, over and over, just to help me, you know, better uncondition my mind. But so I agree with you, once you're ready to hear something, it will just grab your attention for something that you need to learn or know or and that that's what happened to you in vietnam you know you walked into this room that you'd never been in you saw this poor little girl grasping for air and that was the moment when you know something pushed you towards that for the switch to go for the you know the delete button to appear and so, yeah, it, it will happen for all of us that are in a deep suffering journey. We're in a pit somewhere and something will help us out. Now, it doesn't always happen because there are plenty of people that are successful in taking their lives, sadly. Um, but hopefully it will happen more often than not. And just to pick up on the point where you were saying you were with different people, you weren't in a corporate environment, you were with learning to dance, learning to act, learning to speak, learning various other skills, with all of these, what I would call creative arts. And I firmly believe, because I did some volunteering for a homeless charity in Birmingham called Crisis, and one of the things that they do is they do creative art for them. Mm -hmm. You know, they help them do podcasting, painting, writing, dancing, going to the movies, all of these things that are in the creative. Something happens in the brain where you're having to use your right brain uh, more, uh, be more creative, that something gets repaired <laughs> somewhere along yeah. the line. You know, something gets refreshed when you start doing more creative things. Um, because you're not in that very left brain kind of, well, this happens and then that happens and that will be the end, you know, or this is my plan. Step one, step two, step three, boom. In the creative arts, you can't have that. You, you, it's it's more fluid. It's more free. It's more natural. It's It just has to go how it goes type of thing. So, yeah, I mean... That's my theory anyway, in terms of how that helped you. Does that make sense? Yeah. You know, it was, um, 
by the time you've sharpened 180 colored pencils um, and then painted, you know, I don't know how many nails um, with nail varnish that is, you know, should probably have been thrown away, but you still yeah. to get on children's nails. Um, there is just something about, you know, going back to those two questions. Am I safe? Mm. Can I be or can I get safe? And I think for me, with those children, it was seeing things through the eyes of people who have nothing. Yeah. These children shared shoes and clothes and, and everything, but there was a sheer delight. They would smile every day. There was oh, no. thing that made them happy. And for me, coming from out of that darkness where I don't think I had been happy, whether it was how I was thinking about myself, my internal chatter, or the things that were going on around me, I had not been in a very happy place. Mm. And it was the focusing, you know, that whole Christmas day, I was happy. My, you know, my cheeks hurt by the end of the day because I was yeah. so much, I was laughing so much. You know, there's mm. only times you can have a beard pulled and like literally released back into your face on the elastic. Before yeah. you kind of think, this hurts. But I just laughed about it all day. And I think that was my body for that day felt safe. Yeah. Everything felt safe that day. Yeah. And then from that point on, you know, the first thing my coach actually got me to do was to write a list of things that I used to do as a child that I hadn't done that brought me joy, that made me happy. And I had been that child at school who literally always had a book in their hands, was always reading. Right. And yet as an adult, I had books on you know on the shelf mm. had the book in probably four years right and he asked me and that weekend you know I went into the city found an English bookshop and walked out with seven books mm. and from the girl that could finish two or three books in a week when she was 10 or 11 I couldn't even finish a page wow that, you know those first couple of weeks and it was like today I'll read a page tomorrow I'll read two pages Next yeah read for five minutes and then you slowly build it up and now reading for 30 minutes a day is part of my day no matter where I am what I'm doing and I know by the end of the day if I haven't done my reading yes I you know if I've moved it because I went to do something else or you know I, I had meetings so it's kind of got pushed back and pushed back by the time it gets to sort of eight o'clock eight thirty if I haven't had my 30 minutes of reading mm. To sit, I get a bit agitated. It's sort of, oh, I haven't done my reading. You do right. it. You're back in that state because I've trained my body. Yeah. Of all course. The that it gives me for that safety that when I have a book in my hands, it's okay, brain. You can do whatever you need to do because I'm safe. There's no. Yeah. This is my book. I'm good. You know, cup of tea, apple, book. You, know, you digest, heal, whatever you need to because we're safe for now. Fantastic. Would you be able to share a little bit about how you help people? And, you know, do you have a program? Do you have a website? You, you mentioned something about a chapter in a book. Um, yeah. So first place we start with anybody is really to take the quiz. Are you burning out? Right. Yeah. On uh, your reason to breathe dot com forward slash quiz. It's simple yes, no questions, but it will give you an indication of if it's something you should be giving a bit more thought to. Um, and then there's various routes from there, depending on whether someone is burning out or has burnt out. And so sometimes we, you know, I had burnt out. So we went through the whole recovery process and then rebuilt everything. And we call it reset, recharge and thrive. Right. Some people that reset can be the biggest part of the journey. And for others who've maybe not burnt out, but they are, they do need to make some changes in their life because they're in that happier place a lot sooner than actually we are spending more time on what do they want to do in the future? What is it that makes them come alive? What is their reason to breathe? Yeah. And so a lot of the courses are then tailored around, first of all, picking people up, helping them get back to a more normal life, then giving them the tools to not slip again and then look right. Where do we go from here? So really focusing on giving them everything they need 
so that when they decide to go, right, I'm going to set up my own business, I'm going to go for a different job, I'm going to change things in my current job, they have all the tools that they need to, you know, be able to do that to the best of their ability, because we've taken out the, you know, bad reactions to stress or, you know, the things that they were struggling with previously. Yeah. And do you do that like as a one-to-one? Is it a workshop, classroom? Is it a weekend away or how, how a week away? Or how does that happen? So, unfortunately, COVID, that small little thing that we've all had to do, yes. um, has probably put the retreats on hold for, you know, um, another year at least. Um, at the moment, depending on where people are, They can do it one-to-one, they can do it as a group, and we have some online versions of, uh, so for instance, the first stage about picking people up and helping them just get back to a new, more sort of balance, there's Mm. an online version of that called Priority Happy, um, which just takes them through, you know, resetting things so that they are actually happy because they're making it a priority for themselves. Yes. Um, And then other bits, because some people need to talk about these things. Other people need to process that on their own. So there's no set formula that says there are set steps, but there's there's no formula that says it has to be done in a group. It has to be done um, individually, whatever the person needs. That's that's what we're working with. Um, Okay. actually, the the plan is to actually have the retreats, but including volunteering with them. So people get that real experience of the gratitude of being able to help other people, being able to give back as a way to find their reason to breathe or yes, really found it to be able to find a way to ground themselves. Yeah. But people can find me uh, on the website, yourreasontobreathe.com or we have a Facebook page called Your Reason to Breathe. um, And we're on there. Tips and insights into burnout management, burnout recovery, um, and so easiest places to contact me through there. Now, the, my next question is going to be um, an impossible one to answer, <laughs> but I'm still going to try it on you to see what you come <laughs> back with. Um, there's, there's a setup. <laughs> yeah, there, it is a setup. On average, let's say then. Well, let me ask it differently. No, no. On average. And the experience and the people you've worked with, how long does it take for people to reset and get back onto the right path again with, to kind of, I don't know, sometimes it can take longer, sometimes it can get shorter, but just on average, how long does it take to reset the brain and get back onto the, the good path again? <laughs> <laughs> there is definitely no set timeline. No. It's different. Um, you can feel better, you can feel happier in two or three days. Yeah. If you if you, you find the right red flags, find the right. right combination. Sometimes it's as simple as people drinking enough water and getting a good night's sleep. Yes. Will make them feel happier. Have they recovered from burnout? Not at all. But they are in a happier place. Yes. Changing the habits that have caused burnout. Now, you can always say that there's the external factors from your work and the environment you work in, but you always have a choice and it's how you react to those environments. But then we're talking about making habits. We're talking about lifestyle changes. And then you're looking at, you know, any number between 21 and 90 days to create and fix a habit in place something that you do um some people can do that quicker some people it takes three three months before you know whatever it is we've decided so for me for instance i felt better after about a week because i was things every day that made me happy uh they've getting to the reading that i was doing it consistently probably took about eight weeks right for it to become the habit that doesn't that always happens was probably closer to six months. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Really interesting. I, I, yeah, it is interesting because 
it is about the habits you i think you meant you said the magic word there it's about changing habits and we don't realize the bad habits that we've created for ourselves and that become so automatic that we don't even realize they're happening and for some people and i know that and this was definitely the case for me there comes a point where you start to feel happier things start to improve you're feeling in a much better place and then you almost plateau because there's something that you're not ready to give up yeah not ready to change and which is why when i work with people and we get to that point sometimes we'll take a break for a couple of weeks sometimes we'll take a break for a couple of months because just as somebody has to be ready to ask for help or ready mm. to hear the message that maybe yeah. that every week for a year but suddenly it hits home it's the same with when you go through these you know when you're breaking habits when you're when you're trying to change things sometimes you just need to sit with it and process yeah. it. and then when you get to the point again where that message sounds right you've realized that that's something you want to change then it's about picking it up and and taking it forward but never forcing it because you don't want that habit to be associated with the pain of being forced to do it because that's not creating the habit that's going to be sustainable yeah brilliant makes a lot of sense makes a lot of sense <laughs> a lot harder to do but i'm sure it makes it's it's perfect yeah 100 percent um Sarah, is there anything that I should have asked that I didn't ask to get something out of you? You've shared your website and Facebook. How can people get in touch with you via those place, places? Yeah, so there's contact details on all those places. Uh, Sarah at yourreasontobreathe.com if people want to email me directly, it's also fine. Um, but I'm on those places. You know, I'm on the social media for Your Reason to Breathe most days. So yeah. easily... To reach out on there whether it's messenger or direct message um and we can yeah find a way to get a message to you or yeah whatever it is that people need to talk about i i love the the title i love the name i uh, i think that's really i've you know very original but also immediately whenever i'll see that name I will think of you and that little girl in that room. Um, and that's very, very powerful indeed. I've really enjoyed our conversation. Keep up the amazing work that you're doing as if you wouldn't. Um, I hope people will reach out to you, even if it is for just a conversation um, and listen to your wise words and re-listen to the interview again several times and pick up on your words that you've shared with us today. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I wish you so much success and take care. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Thank you for letting me share my story today. You're very welcome. Thank you. Bye for now. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests, so do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.